we are back again with another OWASP Spotlight Series project. And this time we have a very interesting project, which is around threat modeling. Uh, it's been 15 years for me in the industry and I have faced a lot of challenges around threat modeling, or I would say fixing the bugs later in the stage. Now, when we have all started talking about that we need DevOps, DevSecOps, we need Agile, we need all these latest technologies. So it's imperative that we bring in the threat modeling, which is automated, which have, which have less of work for us, and especially for testers, for uh, developers, for anyone who is a part of the application development lifecycle, and even for architects. So today we have Phytium with us and uh, we have Izar who is the uh, project leader for Phytium. And this is one interesting project which I recently got to know. And I thought this, this can really help um, people and the technology at the same time. So Izar, um, let's hear from you about yourself and the project that how did you start this project? Uh, how this idea came into your mind that yes, you need this kind of project to help people. So, hi Vandama, and uh, glad to be here with you guys. It's such a, a, an important uh, initiative that you're taking and bringing these projects uh, closer to everyone. So the idea for PyTM actually is, uh, the idea behind it is an old one, and it comes from long, long, long discussions that I had with uh, Matthew Coles. Uh, back at, in our days at uh, EMC, it started. And basically the thing that we wanted the most was to lower the uh, barrier of entry for developers to start doing uh, uh, threat modeling. Because in our experience, threat modeling had this aura around it that uh, it was something that just architects were supposed to do. And it was something that was very difficult to do. And you had to know a lot of stuff before you could engage into it and so on and so forth. But then, as things progressed and uh, Agile became this big thing in its many uh, representations and flavors and uh, systems started evolving faster. Not only that, but uh, I think that Jim Manico put it very well. Uh, developers became security engineers without knowing about it because right now they are the front line of security out there. It's the line Ooh. of code. It's the thing that you pull in. It's the third party uh, library that you pull in. And uh, we asked ourselves, how can we, how, how can we make developers, how can we make threat modeling more accessible to developers? And at the end of the day, what we came up with was developers write code. So why not let developers describe a system using code, using the thing that they already deal with every day. And then from that code, derive something that may serve as a base for a threat model. Okay. Now that's, that's very important to us to, to uh, to uh, bring attention to, it's a base for a threat model. It's not going to give you a complete packaged, finished threat model, but it's it's something that people can start using to have those discussions that eventually will lead to a more complete one. Um, how does it actually work? Uh, so I actually got to um, see some of the talks, but um, can you just show us that how it actually works? If yes. I uh, if I have to get started with it in my organization or anywhere, which uh, it can help me or developers or security tester, or especially even architects, as you mentioned that architects, it was the architect's job, but then it was very cheesy, tedious. And now it's not just architect's job, it's everyone's responsibility. Right. So let me see if the gods of uh, demos are going to help us here today. So, uh, the idea behind the thing is that you write uh, Python code and then run that script and that generates the artifacts for the, the threat model. Now, um, it's important to say that that's the idea because when I say write Python code, you're not exactly expected to write uh, logic. You're just expected to create uh, uh, objects and give them attributes. So anybody that has ever written anything that's remotely object-oriented should be able to pick this up. There's no need to learn Python for it. There's no need to learn specific constructs for it. So that's another thing that was important to us. It has to be something that the developer can do immediately without having to learn a new language, without having to learn new syntax. So the, the basics of the thing is you import the elements that you're going to use. And for us, an element could be uh, a server could be a uh, data flow, could be a piece of data, 
could be an actor or anything like that. You define your threat model. We are working on documentation. Right now, it's not as good as it should be. So if anybody out there is looking for an uh, open source project to collaborate with, we would really welcome people coming and helping us build the documentation. Um, and then you start describing your system. So we start with trust boundaries, things that serve as, as trust containers for the other elements, an actor, and we say this actor lives inside the trust boundary called internet. Then we have a server. The server has a bunch of attributes. What's the OS? Has it been hardened? Does it uh, take care of uh, input sanitization? And so on and so forth. We define a data store, another data store. The difference between these two is, for example, their data classification. This one is accepting top secret data. This one is accepting restricted data. So with this, we already went one level up in the abstraction saying, OK, my system deals with data, and that data can have different classification levels. And with that, we are able to uh, uh, bring down the, the, the idea if, uh, uh, if the data lives in the right place and if it's going over the right da data flows or uh, traversing the right uh, trust boundaries. Mm -hmm. And so on and so forth, we keep uh, uh, defining elements until we get to data flows. So we have already the trust boundaries. We have already the elements, the, the servers and the, the actors and whatnot. And now we start defining data flows between them. So it, it, it follows uh, uh, a flow <laughs> that is very similar to writing a DFT. You put your, right. your blocks in place, and then you start yeah. going, uh, how, how do they talk to each other? Right. Once we have all the data flows defined, then we can also define pieces of data. Mm -hmm. So we have separated the idea of the data flow itself and the piece of data that goes on top of it, meaning we can have many pieces of data that, tra that traverse one specific data flow. Or we could have uh, a data flow that doesn't have any data defined on it. And then at the end, we just call the loop, which will go and, and, and do whatever we need. Now, how does this look? What can you do? What can it uh, create? Great. So which means uh, you go step by step defining everything and then it will show you a pictorial view, like a proper threat model. Right. So it, it's going to show you a, a bunch of uh, different things. So the first mm -hmm. one that we have, the, the simplest, is actually asking for a DFT. Mm -hmm. We take the Unix approach that a tool should do just what it's good at and nothing else. So for DFTs, right. for example, we rely on dot from uh, GraphViz to actually create the, mm -hmm. the graphic. Okay. So this is what we get from that exact definition that we saw before. You have in oh, red okay. the trust boundaries. Right. You have the data flows. You have mm -hmm. the ordered uh, uh, data that's going and coming with the, the numbers, one, three, four, so on and so forth. Now, let's say that we don't want uh, to, to look at the DFT. We mm -hmm. are working at a different level, and we are more interested in a sequence diagram. Then uh, mm -hmm. YTM can also create from mm -hmm. exactly the same input a sequence diagram. So in this case, it would look like it would look like this. So basically, we can put both outputs one at the side of the other one, and uh, and see that that basically we get exactly the same representation from the same system. Uh, sorry, we get exactly the same system represented in two different ways. Each one of them with their own uh, with their own uh, utility. Now. Uh, to say that this is all it does, it wouldn't be of any almost use because we haven't done anything towards uh, threat modeling at all here. So right now, we have rules for hundred and one threats. Now, what are these threats? We have uh, inherited uh, threat definitions, both from the Microsoft Threat Modeling tool, which was a, a very useful uh, start, 
and from uh, KPEC. So by uh, taking those definitions and translating them into uh, rules that are based on the attributes of each one of the elements, we are now able to identify all of these, these threats from uh, a threat modeling input file. Now, together with that, we can <clears throat> we we also have a very basic uh, uh, reporting capability in the form of a template language. You can create any kind of uh, any kind of uh, report based. This one is an example of a, a markdown template. So we can take from the TM object, for example, the description and put it as the system description, or we can create a table that has all the data flows in it by looping over the elements of a data flow, so on and so forth. Create a, a, a data dictionary, for example, which is something that many system uh, documentations lack in my experience. And then you can list all the threats that were identified as part of the report. Mm -hmm. And since we are doing it in a textual manner, you can use something like Pandoc to go from Markdown to HTML and whatnot, and uh, right. serve that report any way that, uh, that works for this, the system. So, um, now, I am sure there's so much going behind the scenes uh, for the project. So how can, where can actually people reach you and uh, support the project? Like, is there any GitHub where people can actually uh, help in the documentation, any script yes. writing, anything that they can contribute to? The easiest way to, to find us is on GitHub. So we are mm -hmm. at the, uh, here. And of course, being an OWASP project uh, in an incubator form, we also have a pointer from uh, the OWASP projects. Uh, uh, mm -hmm. page and uh, we, we try to be as responsive as we can to the uh, issues that are opened we also have a, a slack space where we discuss right. ideas and, and things like, uh, like that and if you want to um, to get uh, uh, news as they come out uh, you can follow me on uh, twitter i try to post there as much as i as i can whenever something new comes out Perfect. I think this is really great. I'm looking forward to working on it more. And this is really helpful, especially um, I have worked on those DFDs and sometimes it's a big challenge to figure out where the issue is. So everyone, please go ahead and take help from this project. This is one amazing project, which I really love. And I am sure you're going to love and reach out to Izhar if you have any questions, anything that you want to support. Um, or you want to support the project uh, uh, and donate the pro donate to project, do feel free to reach out and you know where the GitHub is so that uh, you can help in documentation and uh, scripts as well. So looking forward to connecting with you all in the next Spotlight series. Thank you so much, Izzer, for joining us and Thank thanks to the PyTM project. Thank you.